I always kind of worry when I'm doing these quiz questions thinking, did we talk about that? Um, <laughs> listen, so, but then I look at y'all study guides and I think, okay, that's it. All right, so what's the function of a probiotic? Would you say, Garrett? Um, because see, he's the one who brought that up. To help replace your magic wand. Yeah, so this is the idea that we can, when we eat foods, natural foods and whatever, our foods aren't sterile, are they? They're not even supposed to be. Our food, our liquid and our foods are not supposed to be sterile, that helps us to reestablish normal flora. And sometimes we know we need to try to balance our normal flora. So by taking probiotics, we're hoping um, that that is helping with that. So that's exactly what the function of them are. What's etiology? Define etiology. Would you say, Brittany? Because I think you, so, did you ask me? Oh, somebody did. But anyway, what'd you say? Yeah, so it's the study of the cause of disease, and who's considered the father of microbiology? Louis Pasteur. Briefly explain why viruses are considered to be either active or inactive, and who would like that one? <laughs> well, let's get funny if I could I know somebody feels confident about why that is. Why are they called active or, in, or inactive rather than alive or dead? <laughs> Yeah, so they're not living organisms. They're either active if they're inside of a host cell. They're parasites, aren't they? I'll look at parasites. Thanks, Amanda. I think Amanda's going to do that too. Um, so, so what is the name of the microorganism that's responsible for why pregnant women are discouraged from eating deli meats during their pregnancies? And the genus is fine. Just give the genus. What is it? Listeria. Listeria. Very good. Define taxonomy. What you say? It's the science of classifying. It is the science of classifying. As long as you said something like that, that's fine. And then Carl Linné, or Linnaeus, I know, I know, specifically remembered for, is remembered for, what is he remembered for within this field? Who wrote these questions? What did you say? <laughs> what did you say? Binomial nomenclature. That's exactly right. So the naming. Do y'all remember this was for the, he's the one responsible for this naming, this two-part naming system that helped us to um, name these organisms so that no matter where you're studying them, they pretty much have the, you'll know what you're talking about, right? Um, no matter what language you might be in. So the germ theory of disease states that blah, 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 blah. Who's given credit for his postulates in this? Who is it? Say it loud. Robert Koch. That's right. What's the name of the specific monomer units that contributes to building proteins? Amino, Amino acids. acids. And I did see a couple of confused things on that, but I hope I just said it so maybe y'all remember it. Hansen's disease is caused by a what kingdom? Bacteria. It's caused by a bacterium that is um, has the name of what? Genus and species. Mycobacterium leprae, right? Correct. Name the first and final of the eyes in microbiology. The first one is is inoculation, and the last one is identification. And you've got to get to that identification as quickly as possible because the bonus asks you what is the conundrum between infectious diseases, which we know can be the most rapidly devastating. And microbiology labs, which means that our hands are tied until we can get that organism growing out, right? So the conundrum is that it takes a while to get to the definitive diagnosis because sometimes we truly do have to have that organ going through those five eyes to get to the ID. And in the meantime, you hope you're going to be close to the close to right on the presumptive because what are you? What are you basing that presumptive? What are you doing based on the presumptive? You've decided which treatment to go with. And if you're wrong, can you make, can you make you doing harm? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that's the kind of <laughs> infectious diseases are rapidly devastating, but in micro, we have to wait, don't we? And go through those eyes a lot of the times. We'll find out that there are a lot of ways that we can sometimes do workarounds. But do you have any questions? Was this fair? You feel like you're learning so right? Yeah. This is a little different from AMP, isn't it? Oh, what a girl. She said thank you. She did. She said thank you. You're on the list now. You are on the list. All right, look, no. All right, guys, so let me tell you what we're going to do real quickly. We're going to do this as, uh, and also after we do this, we'll write down some notes related to this lab. But what I want you to do is think about yourself as 
think about yourself as a person. Okay. <laughs> so that would be easy. That's an easy first step. But as a person, we are our cells are bathed in fluids and they're filled with fluids. Isn't that right? And our cells are having to communicate. We're multi-celled organisms, so we're having we're complex, we're having to communicate. Our cells are having to communicate with each other. And our cells are truly uh, bathed in fluids that are constantly replenishing themselves and that sort of thing. So when we think about body fluids, we know that we have things like blood plasma, uh, interstitial fluids, urine, tears, saliva, enteric. I mean, you produce about nine liters of enteric fluids a day in your GI tract. Now, thank God a lot of that's being reabsorbed, but you just be a little trail of a slimy mess, right? Walking down the halls. But absolutely, most of it's being reabsorbed, so that's a good thing. But we have fluids, right? These are your body fluids. This is a representation of your body fluids. Look at it. Love it. It's you, right? All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about a disease that requires direct body fluid contact, not something that's airborne. So an infectious disease. And I'm going to tell you that one of you is infected with this unknown agent right now. One of you are. And what we're going to do, and you need to pay attention to these instructions, okay? Because you all are going to become epidemiologists in just a few minutes. What's an epidemiologist? An epidemiologist is someone who's going to go in and try to figure out, using Koch's postulates and using all the eyes, they're going to try to figure out what the disease is. And then they're going to try to, an epidemiologist also goes to try to figure out who was the index case if there was an index case, or where was that initial beginning of that infectious process that happened. Now this isn't a disease that's easily transmitted. It's gonna require you to share body fluids. But do we share body fluids as humans? Yes. Sure we do. It's natural and it should be enjoyed. I'm just saying. Okay, so look, but we do. So here, here you go. Y'all got a little vial, you got so much in your vial of your body fluids. You're going to have an encounter, you're gonna pick a person, and you know, you don't always have encounters with the people you live with, so get up, okay? And when I tell you to, get up and go somewhere else, all right? But what you're gonna pick one person, and just, just one encounter, you're gonna pick a person, you're gonna get about half of your fluid, and you're gonna put it in theirs, and they're gonna put about half of theirs in yours. And then your pipettes are empty at that time. You're going to close your little cap up and go back to your seat. Everybody do that. Pick somebody and have an encounter with Get up. Get up and do it. Pick somebody. I think I might have to play just from sheer numbers. Has everybody got it? a partner to encounter? Has everybody got a partner to encounter with? No, you okay, that's fine. That's fine. Just, so has everybody got a partner? Okay, good. Y'all y'all have an encounter. After you've given half of your fluid to them and they've given half, don't give away all your fluid. That's called a vampire. Don't give away all your fluid. Give away half, they're gonna give you half, and you're gonna get half from them. Put the top back on and go back and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Nothing in these vials can hurt you, by the way. Nothing. So your iPads are safe, by the way. There's nothing in there that can hurt you. You can't do that. All right. So how was that? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I, I'm not very well. So here you go. Everybody have one time. Now, is it usual that in your life span you have one encounter? With a, 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 I mean, no. <laughs> is it? So here, here's what I want you to do. I want you, and, and this does is not really related to sex or anything like this. It can be maybe just you know, being intimate in other way, whatever. It could be anything. It could be, it could be like giving blood, right? Because most of us have given blood, haven't we? That's sharing body fluids. All right, so look, I want you, and here's the only rule, you're gonna do this again, but it can't be with whoever you've just had an encounter with. It's gotta be somebody different. Do that same thing with somebody different. 
<laughs> half of your fluid goes to them, only half. And you, yeah, so half. Put your top, go back to where you live, and put your top back on if you didn't have your top with you. Don't spill your fluids. Don't spill your fluids. Hold your vials. Don't spill them. Hold your vials. Yes, don't spill your fluids. This is not going to hurt you if it gets on you. Look, all right. Okay, guys, so that was two encounters. That's nice. Okay, look. Um, we need to do this one more time. And again, it can't be somebody you had an encounter with. One more time, then come back and sit down. One more time. Get up and move around. One more time with somebody different. With somebody different, one more time. Right here, Jenna. Jenna and Rebecca, there. Did y'all have an encounter already? Yeah. It's our first one. Have you had a third encounter? That, oh, so you've already had the third one. Okay. All right. Okay. So let me tell you what this simulation is. Um, what this simulation is, it's a simulation of how infectious diseases that require direct body fluid contact kind of can move through a population. And so it's also a simulation of how somebody can research by asking questions about who was the index case and or who were the couple that was the index case. So by asking questions of each other in this very small thing, y'all will probably in a second figure out who or which two might have been the ones that were responsible for the index case. Now we're going to see who's infected. So what you're going to do is you're going to walk by me with the top off your valve and I'm going to put a drop of this indicator in. If it's yellow, you're not infected, but if it turns pink, you are. So just file by me. Y'all can sort of do it this way and go back to your seat. Go back to your seats after you. If it's yellow, you're clear. If it's pink, you're infected. I don't know who is here. Come on, come on, come on. Good. Just because you're good doesn't mean your partner was good. There was other relationships. Shake it a little bit. You need to mix it a little bit. If it stays yellow, it's good. If it turns purple or red, you're infected. <laughs> hey guys, this isn't real. Okay, it's a simulation. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Shake it a little bit. Shake it a little bit. Just mix it up a little bit. If it stays red purpley, you're infected. If it turns yellow, you aren't. Put your tops back on your vials and just mix them a little bit. And if it's yellow, if it's yellow, you are not infected. If it is this color, you are infected. All right, so now here's what you do as epidemiologists. And this is what epidemiologists truly do. They go into communication and see who's sick, and they start asking tons of questions. What have you eaten? Where have you been? What is it? You know, they ask questions. And they find common denominators, and they get to what's called an index case. So have y'all already figured out who was, by the way, Hold up your things if you're infected. Look around the room. From three encounters, is everybody holding theirs up if they're infected? From three encounters, look how many. It went from one to this many. Did it spread rather quickly? Do you know why I couldn't do one more encounter? Because almost the entire class would be infected. Do you see how quickly something like this spreads? 
Now, let me um, ask you, have y'all talked to each other to figure out who is probably the index case? Hold up if you're infected again. If there, hey guys, were any of you all that aren't infected with ones that are infected, tell them to put their hand, they couldn't have been the index case, could they? They couldn't have been the index case. So if any of you that aren't infected or with ones that are infected, they, they couldn't have been the index case or you would have been infected too, is that right? So, so who's still got their hands up? So, okay, I can tell you this. So all of your partners are infected. Every one of your partners were infected. Every one of your partners are infected. Every one that you've had an encounter. The person who had, it, it probably shouldn't have happened that way. It should have been like two that it looked like. The person who had a number four on their vial was the one that was the index case. So it was, there should have been somebody that you were with that wasn't infected. You had three, you had three encounters. Yeah. Who were your three encounters? One, two, three. Okay, well, what? Jerry. Okay, but the four, that was the index case right there. That really was the index case. Okay, um, <laughs> but, but she had some that weren't infected, and so did they had encounters that weren't infected. So he became infected or whatever. Do you see what I'm saying? So it was these two. It, who did you first encounter? Uh, yeah, so those two ended up doing that. So anyway. Whatever, guys. It's just a simulation, okay? So I want you, now we can start taking notes. I want you to write down, um, and by the way, I'm going to get you guys to um, give these little vials. Just keep the caps on and we'll put them in that little cup over there with your pipettes. But anyway, um, I want you to write down a couple of things. I want you to write down an epidemic, to work these words. Epidemic, pandemic, and endemic. Epidemic pandemic and endemic. Okay, you got those down? All right, so what, let me get, let me define these for you. You should be able to discuss this type of terminology. So what an epidemic is, is when you have an unexpected rise in number of infections in a local population. That's an epidemic an unexpected rise or unexpected increase in numbers in a local population of an infectious disease is an epidemic. A pandemic is when you're seeing those numbers of that infectious disease around the world, around the world. Yes. So an epidemic is when you see a disease, unexpected numbers, so it's going up, increased numbers, in a specific location. That, that answer <coughs> for pandemic is that you're seeing it around the world, around the globe, is a pandemic. Yes, the numbers are, are continuing to go up. All right, so, let me give you an example. On those cruise ships, you'll sometimes, sometimes see epidemics of that uh, Norwalk virus. Have y'all heard of that? The norovirus <coughs> is sometimes called the Norwalk virus. And on those cruise ships, they'll have these, these epidemics where they have you know several hundred passengers are very sick. Hampton Sydney had an epidemic. So those are like local, you know, it's just in a local area but those are epidemics happening there, right? Pandemics are around the world, and that a pandemic, an example of a pandemic going on right now is HIV infections and AIDS. That's a pandemic that's happening. Now, let me tell you about endemic. Endemic means that it's natural to have a few cases happening because this infection is endemic meaning it's part of the ecosystem does that make sense so you're expecting a certain number to be happening at any given time does that is that clear to you dakota you you get that okay so good anybody have any questions about those that terminology so in epidemiology we understand that most of these infectious diseases are endemic aren't they they're endemic 
But what we're looking for are epidemics happening and or certainly worried about pandemics occurring. Yeah. So an example of it, that's a good question. So in examples of endemic, well, everything's kind of endemic if you think about it, but like there are certain viruses that are just endemic. Uh, chicken pox viruses, measles, they're in our population. They're here. We have those in our populations. But what we don't want to see are unexpected numbers happening, right? Because that would be called a, an epidemic in those little areas. And then you hope that epidemic wouldn't turn into a pandemic. Are we good? So, so you guys have written that down. Now, we also know that index cases sometimes were like food outbreaks and we um, infectious diseases that cause food outbreaks like, um, like listeriosis, which is the disease that listeria causes. Somebody put that it has a high mortality rate. It isn't so much that it has a high mortality rate, it's that it, I mean, it does, all diseases have a particular mortality rate associated with them. Listeria doesn't have it much higher than other things, but the thing is it can cause harm to a fetus, can it? And we do know it can cause spontaneous abortions. We do know that. Now, um, like we see these epidemics that are happening of like Escherichia coli from contaminated food sources. There's been listeria uh, outbreaks, listeriosis, right? There's sometimes been some protozoal outbreaks from contaminated um, vegetables and whatever, but they are water sources. And we figure it out that they're happening. The proper authorities come in and they shut that thing down. You get what I mean? And they start controlling. If they have to quarantine, they quarantine if they have to. But they figure out where the original source is coming from, like you all figured out your original sources, and you try to shut that down by treating, right? Many things can be treated. Many things can be treated and eradicated. Some things not so much so with infectious diseases, right? Um, but some things can, so we'll, we'll learn more about that. Are y'all good with this? You're good? Now, who is, who is responsible for the information about whether an epidemic's happening? I want you to know that there are diseases that are required by law to be reported. They're required by law to be reported because they're either that serious or they have that serious of a potential to cause epidemics and or pandemics. So there is a list, and we'll get to it soon in your textbook, it's in your textbook, of reportable diseases. And again, by law, your physicians, your clinics, your hospitals, they don't have a say. By law, they must report those diseases. Now, who are they reporting them to? And I would want you all to understand that they report them to the health, the state health department that then reports them to CDC. How many of y'all have heard of CDC? Does, do you know what it stands for? Exactly, Centers of Disease Control. The CDC is um, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, but CDC has um, satellites in every major city in every country in the world. Oh my goodness, why is that? Why is that? Because here's what we know. It's gonna take one good human pathogen to potentially wipe out Homo sapiens on this planet. Would a good pathogen have to wipe out everybody? Or do you have to wipe out every individual in a population to cause a, an extinction? No. You just have to wipe out enough. And one perfect pathogen, we are one perfect pathogen away from potentially changing the course of humans' existence on the planet. And we know that. So the Centers for Disease Control has have experts in the field, every country in the world, looking for particular infectious agents that we know about, but even ones we haven't identified yet that we will use what to identify when, when they may show up, hoax postulates, to figure out and to be ready to call in 
the support that they'll need to quarantine down the areas. So the Walking Dead is a good example of that, Jenna said. I have heard that from where the CDC headquarters were because the Walking Dead. Really? I have heard that from other students, and you're absolutely right. And a lot of the fiction things that we hear about are based on what things that we know can really truly happen. Right? So I do want you all to know that the Centers for Disease Control's budgets have been cut drastically by more than half in the last couple of years. Are you concerned? You should be grossly concerned. I'm just saying. You should be. Because maybe you're thinking, well, Americans don't have to protect everybody. Hey, protecting Americans, can we need to protect the whole world to protect us too. Are we part of the world? This is a global, we are now in a global situation. You understand with travel now, there's no such thing as isolationism. If you think so, you are an infant in understanding society. I'm just saying, you are. And, and that sounded really harsh, didn't it? But I'm just, I didn't mean it harsh. I'm just saying, you can get on a plane now with an infectious disease that you don't even have a symptom for and stop in several areas around the world now and then now we've got a pandemic happening because you're just in the incubation period, but it's a disease that you're spreading while you're in the incubation period. Are you hearing me? Let me give you another example. And it's one of the reasons the CDC and write down the WHO. WHO is the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization have come about. These are not political organizations, are they? These are not political organizations at all. These are organizations to try to save humankind, right? WHO is the World Health Organization, along with CDC, is looking at all of these, these types of diseases. So, so let me give you an example. Y'all have all heard of Spanish influenza? Have you, have I talked to you about it? Okay. All right, so I want to tell you about the influenza of 1918, and I want you to know about it. I want you to, I want you to do your own research. It's, it would be interesting for you to do. I think you found it interesting. Don't think 1918 was a long time ago? No. It was obviously 100 years ago, which sounds like a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, my grandmother, my, we called her Big Mom. She was about this tall. <laughs> But anyway, Big Mama and Big Daddy had a three-year-old named Mary Wiggum. Um, it was my mother's oldest sibling was Mary Wiggum, right? So they lived in Sachs, Virginia. Any of y'all know where Sachs is? Okay. You know where Sachs is, and that's where they lived, um, Big Mama and Big Daddy, in 1918. And Big Mama's brother, Uncle Lyshi, that's, that's short for Elijah. Why would you do that to Elijah and call Elijah? <laughs> okay, so anyway, but Uncle Aishi was in Europe in World War I. He was in Europe. He'd never been out of Charlotte County until he got drafted to go to war. This is, his, this is my big mother's brother, right? So the influenza of 1918, I know a lot of you all probably already know a lot about it, but let me tell you about this influenza. It was, it was, the flu strain that you all know about that comes around every year. Except this particular year, that influenza mutated and became incredibly virulent. That influenza flu strain, the, like the one that comes around every year around the globe, became incredibly virulent. It is estimated that more than 50 million people died from the influenza of 1918. Now you all understand the population was much less 100 years ago, right? Do you, you remember that? In World War I, which was a war to supposedly end all wars because it was so horrific, the trench warfare, using gas to kill people, the soldiers were writing home in the trenches, writing their letters saying, I'm not as worried about the bullets as I am my buddy coughing next to me. I think he has the flu. And then that follow-up letter saying he died. The East Coast, as that influenza moved along the East Coast in 1918, the first wave of it in Philadelphia, one day 2,000 died that day. 
It wasn't the young and the old. That influenza, with that strain was so virulent, it was called the strain of the healthy farm boys. In Charlotte County, Charlotte County was very rural 100 years ago. Every family lost somebody. Some families lost everybody when it came through. As it hit the East Coast and people were dying at numbers that they couldn't even handle the dead, they were telegraphing to the West Coast. There's, they have all these telegraphs. Get your doctors, get your lawyers to start building caskets because you won't be able to keep up with the dead. Some remote in the Midwest towns lost everybody to this influenza. This was the type of influenza that you don't just start feeling bad, body aches, and you feel crummy for a few days and you get up. This influenza was hitting people. They were going to bed with their spouses feeling okay and a spouse waking up beside their spouse that was dead next to them the next morning. That's how quickly the symptoms hit and that's how quickly their lungs filled up with blood and that's how quickly people died. People die from the typical influenza, not from actually the influenza. They typically die from influenza, the ones that, ones that go around now since then because of getting something else on top of it. They're either weak, their immune systems are weak, so they're little babies or they're older people, and they end up getting a bacterial infection on top of it and they die after days. But this wasn't the case with the influenza of 1918. It killed, and it killed quickly, and it killed healthy people in their prime. Since that one around, we're just waiting for the next one that mutates and becomes that virulent. And by the way, there have been two of them. But guess who stopped them in their tracks? The CDC. Do you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Mary William died. Big Daddy was in a coma. For some reason, Big Mama didn't get it. And in sacks, people would come to your homes. Big Mama used to tell me this. Um, they would come to your yards and they would yell to you, do you because they wouldn't dare come in. But they would yell to you, Maddie, do you need anything? Can you imagine the day she had to say, I need a coffin for Mary William? That happened. Epidemiology. I thought my dad was lying to me when he told me that. His parents lie. <laughs> <laughs> Parents do lie sometimes, but it, it, if they ever do, it would be for your good. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, that is not a lie. <laughs> no, that is not a lie. That actually happened. And, and Big Mama, just to give you an idea about why y'all are here where you are and how Big, Big Mama had 14 children. This was before birth control, right? Mary William was, Mary William was her first child, three years old. She's, and they were incredibly poor. But she saved her little shoes and the little bucket that she used to play with in her toy. That makes me sad. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but she had three other children, 10 that lived to be adults and older in life. And she felt so blessed for that because in her, and she used to talk to me about this. I think it's why I went into microbiology. Um, she felt so blessed because it was a 50-50 chance her child would make it to five. And she had 10 out of 14 that were long lives. She had one die from pertussis, whooping cough, and she had two others die from diphtheria. Do you all have to think about that? Is that part of your consciousness? Worrying about pertussis, whooping cough, or diphtheria? Why not? Because you have immunizations. Do you understand that you have some in your society now that are not getting immunized? Does that affect everyone in the society? Are there outbreaks and epidemics now of measles? And does, does measles have a mortality rate? Yes, it does associate it with it. It's considered a relatively mild childhood illness until it's your child and your child dies. And then you don't care what the mortality rate is. Your child died because they came, became exposed to someone who didn't get their immunizations. Do you get what I mean? In 100 years, we have forgotten so much about why, how we've gotten to where we are. And that is going to make us at risk for repeating the past. <coughs> would you all agree, <coughs> am I like crazy or would you, am I making sense? So 
So absolutely. And then there's, there's ways that we know to go about doing some of these things. But this is a reality. This is definitely reality. We don't have to think about our children at 50 50 chance of them making it to five because we have antibiotics, we have immunizations, and we have watchdogs that we better be supporting because truly the CDC would tell you, any of the experts there would tell you. I have one student who's working there now because after the student, she went on and wanted to do this. But there is, we have experts that say and have been saying since 1918, it's just going to take one more perfect pathogen and it's going to, and then what's going to happen? Civilization's going to fall apart when that happens. You do get that. People are going to sort of lose that ability. Uh, you know, you think you're civil. You think you're civil. I want y'all to think about it right now because this is important to talk about and I, I do need you all thinking about this. They, you see this, but they never try to, and I'm not trying to alarm you. I'm just trying to let you know this is, this is real. They tell you to have an emergency kit that you wouldn't have to leave your home for three weeks. They could, have y'all heard that before? You should have enough food, water, whatever, that you really wouldn't have to leave for at least 10 days, but maybe even three weeks, right? Because one of the times, one of the last times that, that one of these influenzas came about, one of the last times, is, is when it happened, and if it has gotten out, it was going to cause a ton of deaths. And I remember at the time, I had like a two, three, and a four-year-old, right? And I'm living in Keysville. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, I'm glad we shut that down. Because that was going to be really hard for me to tell my husband, if he goes out to get cigarettes, he's not coming back home. Because once he goes out to get to the grocery store, he may pick up what? And then what would he be bringing back? I was like, uh-uh, no. And if I have to shoot you at the edge of the yard, I will. Because you're not bringing it into my children, right? So anyway, I mean, think about what you would do. What would you do? You, I had a two, three, and a four-year-old looking at me. You think I wasn't going to protect them? No, no, no that's, just, that's just survival. What would you do? Huh? What'd you say? I said mama shark. <laughs> Is that like a movie or something? Mama shark. No. I, well, guys, y'all think, think about it because hopefully it would never come down to that for you, that you would have to make that choice. But you would really have to think about making that choice. If you knew something had that kind of mortality rate, what would you risk? You might risk a lot for your own, like your own sake. But I can promise you, for your children, you might do more than, that, than what you would even expect you could do. Do you get what I'm saying? Um, and I gave it some, some serious thought and had that conversation. I had that conversation. You know, no, that is just not happening. So anyway, uh, people were doing amazing things in 1918. They were putting little garlic uh, poultices on their children and little necklaces and stuff because they thought they could maybe ward off evil spirits. You know, it was just a horrific, horrific time. Why did you Okay, so so I don't know if there's other questions. So why did that particular influenza become so virulent? Because it attacked the lungs, and so the lungs became literally were leaking fluids. And so what would happen within a short period of time is typically the people who died quickly in the first few hours suffocated. They drowned in their own lung fluids. Now, here's the good news. I mean, I didn't mean to scare anybody today. Look, so here's the good news, though. The good news is we do have all this, and we've progressed, right? So we progress and we understand that we have a lot of things in place that people didn't have in place back then. We also know that we can treat some of the signs and symptoms of influenza cases that they couldn't have gotten to in 1918. And people weren't able to get to places and whatever. So now, right now, is there a cure for the flu influenza? No, there's no cure for influenza. What do we do? We, we treat the signs and symptoms, and we've really gotten better at being able to control those signs and symptoms and treat them. And that is, is what would happen. So we would expect, we would hope that even if that same one came around as virulent, it wouldn't have quite as many deaths because people would be able to get to facilities. They would have, you know, um, care quickly and maybe not have quite as many deaths. But um, 
but yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to actually go. Now this chapter, what I'd like to tell you about this chapter is just this chapter, and I don't think anybody's going into pathology, right? Is anybody going into pathology, medical technology, pathology? I didn't think so. So this chapter is really about people who are becoming going into pathology. So I would, I would want them to dig a little deeper. For you guys, I, I'm just going to give you kind of the basics about some of this. And if I don't talk about it, do you need to know it? No. So it's really just kind of the basics. But they really are common sense kinds of basics that I would want you to know. So what did I tell you? Even before inoculation, even before... Even before that specimen gets put onto the media that it needs to be put on, what did you have to think about as the primary care professional who was getting the specimen? How to, how to get that specimen correctly, how to correctly get the specimen. There's a, pro, there's, you know, a proper way, a non-proper way. And so if you have ever have any questions about how to collect the specimen, how to collect blood cultures, which are very different type of phlebotomy than getting just regular blood testing, isn't it? How many of you had blood cultures drawn? So some of you had, and you know there's a whole different prep technique that they're going to use. It's completely different. So getting urine samples, getting lumbar punctures, getting sputum cultures, getting wound cultures, you have to know what you're doing. You have to know how to collect the specimen. You have to know how to send the specimen to wherever it's got to go, the lab in time. Some of them you can let go for even a day as long as it's refrigerated, but some things have to get there within 30 minutes. So you have to know how to handle it. And then once it gets into the microbiology lab, we're going to assume everything, it was treated exactly right. And, you know, it was, it was collected correctly. It was sent correctly. It's in the correct containers and it's gone to us. And so in the, in the microbiology lab, we're going to figure out what to put it, what media to put it on. Some of them are plated. Some of them are broth mediums, right? So we're going to figure it out depending on what the site of, this, of the collection was. And this is a pathologist. They're going to make those rules. So you don't have to decide that. That's going to happen in the lab. But this is going to be what's going to be decided, whether it's to go to plate, whether it's to go to broth. Sometimes even in living tissues. What can you all tell me right now if you were suspecting what agent would you need to have living tissues to culture? If it's E. coli or listeria or bacteria, that'll grow on plated media and broth. But what did y'all tell me has to have living cells, viruses? So if it's a virus culture, you have got to have a what? You've got to have living cells to do that. This is why viral cultures don't often get cultured. Viral um, things don't often get cultured. Because do you, can you imagine that this is expensive? Yes. It is expensive. And a lot of times if you will go on the presumptive diagnosis of signs and symptoms, they'll be so classic that you're going to kind of know. And there's some other testing we can do too that are, that's pretty quick. And we won't really have to do living cultures, right? but it would require living cultures for viruses. Y'all get that, okay? All right, and then after we decide what kinds of plates, if we're gonna use broth medium, we're taking these specimens, we're handling it perfectly to get it inoculated. <coughs> By the way, I just ordered today, oh, I did it yesterday, but hopefully it'll be come, they'll be coming in. Y'all's plated auger plates and stuff so that you can do your own cultures. Y'all are gonna be able to culture a couple of different body parts and see what normal flora you have growing there, okay? Um, but anyway, so, so once you have them plated or in the broth though, then you have to figure out what? You're gonna have to, well, not that. You're gonna have to figure out where, how are you gonna incubate it? And by the way, if it's growing in you, what temperature do you know it likes? So I want you all to know isolation, or ice, excuse me, not isolation, I'm so bad. Inoculation means you're choosing which media. You're choosing which media you need. Incubation, you're choosing what temperatures and what atmospheres to put it at. So if it likes you, it likes 37 degrees Celsius, doesn't it? So guess what we incubate most things at? Most human specimens we incubate at what degree? 37 Celsius, because that's 98 plus, you know, whatever. So, so most of them we do, 
incubate that at that. And that's what y'all are going to be incubating your specimens at. It's 37 degrees Celsius. Now, wait a minute though. Sometimes when we get a specimen in pathology and we know that there might be a pathogen there that is finicky, it's finicky, and it's not going to like just room air, it's going to need added CO2. So in, in as far as just temperatures, we also have to think about atmospheres. So we often increase CO2. Sometimes we take out all the oxygen. What kind of organisms will we need to do that for? Anaerobes, Janet. Did you say that? Good job. Anaerobes. Write down anaerobes versus an aerobe. An anaero ana in front of something means without, doesn't it? So anaerobic bacteria can only grow where there's no oxygen. So if I were to get a specimen from, from a patient and I knock it, I, I put it on the plates just fine, but then I put it where there was oxygen, am I ever gonna get out that pathogen? No. So for some specimens, specimens that I know could potentially have anaerobes as the pathogen, I've got to put it in an atmosphere that is anaerobic. I'm also gonna put it in an atmosphere that's got higher CO2, right? And I'm gonna incubate it at typically 37 degrees. When you think about this incubation, I want you all to think about not just temperature and acid. I want you to think about that you can use those to actually uh, pull out your pathogen but inhibit the normal flora. So let me give you an example. I want y'all to write down this organism's name. You didn't think you could leave it today without a new organism, did you? Okay, did you have influenza? Did you write influenza down as a virus? Y'all wrote that down. Do y'all understand that the, by, that virus goes around the world every year? Influenza goes around every year, sometimes a couple of trips. So that goes around, that's normal. That's endemic, that's normal. And the influenza virus is not very stable, meaning it's changing a little bit. It's outfit. And so this is what we worry about, is that it'll change again, become really virulent uh, one day and, and get out. But anyway. Oh, here's another organism. Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas, P-S-E-U-D-O-M-O-N-A-S, P-S-E-U-D-O, pseudo. Monas, M-O-N-A-S, pseudo, P-S-E-U-D-O, pseudo. We all know pseudo means, P-S-E-U-D-O, as a prefix always means the same thing. What does it mean? It means false. It means false, actually, pseudo, pseudomonas. But anyway, this is, a, this is a bacterium, pseudomonas. Here's the species, you ready? The species, and I don't spell for you, so, so you're welcome. Here's the species. It's called... Aeruginosa, A-E-R-U-G-I-N-O-S-A, -E Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This bacterium is in all water sources, all water sources. If you take a bath this morning, you were bathing with Pseudomonas. If you took a shower, you were, you were rinsing off with Pseudomonas. <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, pseudomonas is everywhere. It's, in the, it's, it, it's everywhere, so it's okay. I mean, it's okay when it's okay, but when it's causing, when it's a pathogen, when it becomes a pathogen, it's a problem. But let me tell you in a hospital and in patients where we worry about pseudomonas originosa the most in, in, in serious situation. By the way, it is, and y'all go ahead and write this down, it is what causes swimmer's ear. If you've ever had swimmer's ear, it was pseudomonas originosa. And it's painful because you have a lot of pain receptors in that ear canal. So when that thing becomes inflamed, it hurts, doesn't it? <laughs> right. So swimmer's ear is caused from pseudomonas originosa, and oh, well, you're going to get over it. Okay. You could even get over that on your own. Um, but the eardrops help. Right. So, okay. But what we really worry about it is this. We worry about it in hospitals and burn units. And burn units. If a burn patient that's had significant loss of skin barrier gets a pseudomonas 
infection, their, their, their prognosis takes a dive. Let me tell you where else we worry about it. Y'all have probably heard of cystic fibrosis, haven't you? But it's an inherited disease of the chloride pumps, cystic fibrosis of our cells, chloride pumps. This is an inherited disorder. And what happens is people can't form that nice saline little barrier on their cells that where the extracellular fluid washes off so the cells uh, become sticky. And Pseudomonas aeruginosa ends up usually being, or one of the species of Pseudomonas, the cause of death in cystic fibrosis patients. They end up getting pneumonias um, from this, this microorganism. And it's a very difficult bacterium to treat. It can be hard to treat. Okay, so let me tell you something about Pseudomonas aeruginosa though. It likes 42 degrees Celsius just as well as it likes 37. So what can I use the temperature for? I can use it to isolate out Pseudomonas if it's there. Because your normal flora, much of your normal flora won't like 42 degrees, but Pseudomonas is happy as a lark. Are you with me? So when I'm talking about when I'm talking about incubation, it means knowing what temperatures, knowing what atmospheres, knowing what it's going to need during that time that it's supposed to be growing, and using those things to get them out as quickly as possible. Did I say time was of essence? Time is of essence, isn't it? All right, now, do we expect from cultures that we get that they're going to be just one thing growing? You, you get sputum up. You know what, does everybody know what sputum is? It is that mucus secretions that come from the lungs. Now, I'm not talking about hocking something because that came down from your nose and you hocked it back up, right? Sputum is coming from the lungs. So you take sputum and you try to get a great specimen, but what did you probably get in there with it? Some mixed oropharyngeal flora is probably gonna be there, right? Oropharynx flora, normal. But you try to avoid it a little bit. So now I've got a culture that's got a lot of different things, but am I gonna be able to look at the colonies and see which ones might be bad guys versus the ones that are just friendly? Well, as a microbiologist, you have to be able to recognize colonies. And you're going to have to take the ones you think are bad guys and get them isolated. So now I've, I've incubated. I've got a lot of things growing. But I've got to get out the potential pathogens in pure culture. That's what isolation means. I've got to get them in pure culture. And by the way, when I get them in pure culture, now I'm going to have to wait till they grow. Oh my gosh, this is that conundrum, isn't it? Oh, hello. No. <laughs> this is that conundrum. I've got somebody who might be dying. We're not sure what they've got, but I've got to try to get this ID out, and I'm having to wait for them to grow. So I've isolated. Once they're isolated, this is what you inspect it. You certainly do, and y'all are going to be doing grants. You're going to be doing all kinds of stains. You're going to break it down. Stains, you're going to be looking at the microscope, looking at the morphology, the shape, looking at how they stain, look what they look, looking at what they look like. Then you're going to do biochemical tests, and guess what that's going to get to you, get to you eventually? Identification. Are we good? Are we good with that? So that's basically what I want you to get out of this chapter. Is, are those five eyes and understanding the basics of those five eyes? Why can't I just inspect? Why can't I just um, instead of isolating something and getting it where everything looks the same? Well, actually, you can see on here things don't look the same. Do you see how this one isn't yellow, but that one is that colony? So there's at least two different things on there. Do you see this too? So, so you've got to get them isolated. Why? Because if I take it and I put biochemical tests. I, and it's a mixed culture, I can't trust those biochemical test results doing positive or negative because it was two different things in there, right? So I've got to get them isolated. And, and by the way, the definition for pure culture means only one thing is growing. Only one thing is growing. Does that make sense? All right. Now I want to tell you about something too. 
and, and see if this doesn't make sense. There's some bodies of uh, collection of, of specimens that you only expect one thing growing because those, those uh, areas should be sterile. What is a sterile body fluid you know that should be sterile? Urine. Urine actually should be, so it's a sterile body fluid until it comes through the opening of the urethra and just picks up the normal flora there, but it's a sterile body fluid. What else? Blood. So that should be a sterile body fluid. So these cerebrospinal <laughs> fluid, sterile body fluid, right? So when you get those specimens, usually infectious diseases, there's only going to be one thing growing. So usually that's going to be the bad guy, right? Because you don't expect to have normal flora there. And as long as the specimen was cor correctly um, res you know, taken, then it shouldn't have been contaminated. A lot of times in blood cultures, though, we see contaminated blood cultures. And, and it, whatever, we, it's easy for us to figure that out in microbiology, that they're contaminated. There's just normal skin flora, there's, and that's, that's what's growing in them, right? But anyway, so some specimens, if only one thing is growing, you can bet that's the pathogen. If it's, if it's only one thing growing and it's already in pure culture, you can bet it was the pathogen. But let me tell you how we decide when we're inspecting whether something's a pathogen or not. This is going to represent an auger plate. So picture that this, does everybody know what an auger plate looks like in a Petri dish? Everybody can visualize that, right? Y'all are going to do your own. So this is like 5% sheep blood, which is 5% sheep blood and, and terrific soy auger is like food for bacterium, right? And right now it's sure because I haven't, there's nothing growing on it because I haven't inoculated the specimen on it yet. But if I take some sputum and I take the sputum hoping that it was collected like it should have been and trying to avoid the mixed or pharyngeal flora, and I take some mucus from the sputum and I inoculate this plate today with a sterile, taking a sterile swab into that sputum and I'm going to put it on this plate about a nickel size. And I'm going to take a sterilized loop and then the sterilized loop and spread out that sputum on about a third of this plate. You see what I did? And I'm spreading it out so that the microbes that are there aren't having to compete for food in the plate. I'm gonna sterilize the loop again, let it cool again, and I'm gonna go into this initial area about three times, three or four, and I'm gonna do this. Then I'm gonna sterilize that loop again, and I'm gonna go into this area a few times, and now I'm using the entire surface of the plate, right? And I've taken some from the original specimen and I've spread it all throughout the plate. Now, what we would like to see happen, we expect to see it's a sputum culture. Are we expecting to see some flora that's in the mouth, some bacteria? We're expecting to. If those microorganisms are growing just up here in this area, the lab report will say one plus, some labs call that few, mixed or pharyngeal flora. But if there's some colonies growing out in this area, what would that be? Uh, this is a quantification, quantifying this. Quantification, right? So what would it be if it's growing out in this area? What would the report say? Two plus. If that mixed or pharyngeal flora is growing all the way out of a colony, colonies would be seen all the way out here, that would be called three plus. Are y'all with me on that? Now, what would happen though, what would happen though, if I saw, if I had a report and it said one plus mixed or pharyngeal flora and three plus staph aureus. Is staph aureus? Staph aureus is everywhere. It's on our skin, it's in our mouth, it's up our nose, it's in crevices. What, so are we worried about that staph aureus? Look, you're using quantification to make you realize when it's a pathogen or not. If, there, if this was such a good specimen that there were very little bit of normal flora, but a ton of staph aureus. You can bet that's a pathogen. That is a pathogen. But what about the other case? What would have happened if I had if I had three plus mixed or pharyngeal flora, but only one plus staph aureus? What would you think then? 
Would you say gentle? gentle words? No, I said it's futile. It probably can't. You use quantification to help you to understand if something is a pathogen or not. We use that in the lab. We do. I'll give you another example. Getting urine samples. Are they easy? I mean, peeing in a cup sounds like it'd be kind of easy. And gentlemen, it is for you. But for women, post-puberty is not as easy to pee in a cup, right? So let me, and I'll say this because you see it all the time, and this is why when you see urine samples, they will look at the spot urine, and if there's many, many or three plus, how they do it, they usually say many, squamous epithelial cells in that woman's urine, it means that it was contaminated with probably vaginal flora. Now, can you trust that as a good urine sample? You cannot. And especially if you see many bacteria, but that's okay because is there, are there supposed to be bacteria in vaginal secretions? Yes. And are there supposed to be even bacteria surrounding the periurethral opening? Yes. But what you shouldn't have seen was all that squamous epithelial cell, and you shouldn't see a mixed group because urine is a sterile body fluid. And if there's something that's causing uh, an infection in urine, it's usually just by itself. It's pure. Let me tell you the most common bacterial cause of urinary tract infections in women post puberty is Escherichia coli. Have y'all heard of E. coli? Yes, you have. Where did y'all say it's from? It's in everyone's colon. It's your predominant flora in your colon. That means it's a predominant organism in your perianal area, right? Guess where women get their E. coli infections that cause urinary tract infections? Who did they get them from? Themselves. Themselves. It became an opportunistic disease. An opportunistic disease. When somebody has a urinary tract infection, it is almost always caused from just one thing. I mean, just one organism. In women, it's E. coli. Do men typically get E. coli urinary tract infections? or is their periurethral opening in a very different kind of place than women's are? Yeah, very different. So they have skin flora. So it's the opportunistic skin flora that we see causing urinary tract infections in men typically, unless they've been doing things that, you know, doing things. So, uh, you know, <laughs> so just saying, you know, just saying. But yeah, no, right. Right, so when you do these tests, Three is not the location of the swab. It's where the colonies are growing out to. Okay, so if the there's so one. much that was in your original specimen that these these dots represented colonies. Sorry if I didn't say. It. So if there's so much in this original specimen that colonies are growing all the way out here, all over your plates, that's called three plus growth. Or some labs report that as many. If it's just up in here then there's one plus or few, and you'll see that on the report. Or if it's out into here, it's two plus or moderate, right? Yeah. And so that's what the reports look like. It depends on what lab is sending the report, whether they use the few, moderate, many, or the one plus, two plus, three plus. Now, sterile body fluids are quantified differently. They're, they're quantified by volume, and I'll talk about that later. Did we do anything new today? Yes, all right. Okay, all right. So, um, guys, I need your vials and you can just put them in these cups, okay? Um, and this cup, I probably need a bigger cup. Okay. Um, and I'll see you. At Monday, we're off. Did y'all know that? Monday, we're off. Um, do y'all have enough to do your day thing? Okay, all right. Thank you. All right. To determine whether something is a potential pathogen, we use quantification to help us determine whether something's a pathogen or whether it was just part of the normal flora. Because don't we have potential pathogens in most of our body areas? We do, but they should be in very what? Low, low, low numbers, right? Okay. Do we have what? No, not today, but we will next Wednesday. We'll have another little one. This little one we did today was just a little, um, a little fun thing. Did you have fun?